Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of our living God this morning. Sounds like a highfalutin phrase for something that looks very practical here today, um, but it's it's very realistic. We are here to worship God, and uh, and to honor Him, uh, to draw near to Him, um, and we'll do so around a common uh, understanding, a common dogma, a common truth, uh, which uh, is given to us in the Word of God this morning. Um, so to start, I like to uh, suggest that you open your bulletins and look at the uh, theme this morning. Uh, and again, for visitors, I don't know that we have any visitors. Welcome back, Katie. Um, but uh, we're going to, uh, every, every Lord's Day, we uh, sort of uh, reorient our minds with some aspect, attribute, characteristic, um, certainly a truth that uh, emanates from God's word. And this morning it is that Christ is kind and if you read, the, I'm not going to read this whole passage in, in Luke here, um, but it, uh, at least in part, um, I, I am going to read it. This, it's, a, it's a great passage. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will uh, be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. And then it goes on to say, be merciful. Um, just as your father is merciful and do not judge or you will be judged it goes on to say and, and, and it will be given to you in like measure um, but I wanted to focus in for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men well the passage that comes to mind for me that exemplifies that is 1 Peter 2 where Christ is hanging on the cross he's being spat at and reviled and what does he do? he prays for them he doesn't spit back or revile kindness and Really, what we tend to do is we hear kindness and we think, oh, I know my theology. He was kind in his sacrifice, which uh, was the basis of my declaration for innocence, and therefore I'm saved. And that's true. That's certainly true. Uh, but Christ was specifically kind in that he didn't revile back. And he is our example. In, in our culture, we tend to think kindness is a, a man or a woman or a child who's soft-spoken or, um, um, and, and there's different ways to mischaracterize that, but essentially uh, it's a, uh, either a lowly demeanor, soft demeanor, soft-spoken, uh, and, and, and the like. And I'm gonna suggest that is way off base, way off base. Kindness, at least uh, by one definition, is not thinking of yourself, it's thinking of others. It's directing your affections to somebody else and being slow to speak and having their best interests at heart. So when Christ is hanging on the cross, guess whose interests he has at heart? Those who were spitting at him, those who were ungrateful and reviled him. And that's our example. Granted, we're all, we all have, do, and will fall short. And I trust that as we engage in this worship service, we'll have a greater love and appreciation for the fact that Christ died, was reviled and spit at for that very reason, that we could not overcome sin. And so he does for us. Nonetheless, kindness doesn't stop at his cross work. Kindness is our calling to one another and to a lost and dying world, to be slow to speak, to have others' interests before ourselves to be careful about our speech and our actions. So I would encourage you, certainly ponder this, um, not simply as a prep for worship, although it is, um, but as a way of life, to be a person characterized as being kind. And again, that's not soft-spokenness. That's, that's a very demonstrative, assertive, very intentful and purposeful uh, frame of mind that says I'm going to think of you first before myself. My thoughts and my actions will result in that. You know, today in the sermon, um, and as you look at that first um, ten verses in First Thessalonians, you're going to see exactly that. You're going to see the result. You're going to see the result which Paul commends them for because of their right understanding of kindness as an example. 
So let me open us in prayer, and then uh, we will be ushered into worship. Let's pray. Father, for this passage in Luke, which describes um, our Lord and his character, his intent, and, uh, and ultimately his purpose, to be kind to us in uh, his sacrifice for us, but also his calling uh, and purpose given to us, and that is to exude uh, the kindness of Christ to those around us. And so may we be paraders. May we be uh, a people who desire to communicate the character of Christ in our own lives uh, to those in whom we come, come into contact with, certainly in worship toward you, but also in our relationship with our brothers and sisters gathered here and in, and in other places, and then more largely uh, to this world uh, in which we are antagonists with so often and at odds with and, uh, and provide a, a great opportunity for us to demonstrate what Christ demonstrated on the cross, that when we're spit at and reviled, we don't return in like. So receive our worship this morning, we pray, and in doing so, we pray you do it on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and uh, that your name would be honored and lifted up in the hearts of a people which you've brought together very practically here in proximity, but also brought into union with as one body. Please continue to pray. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Clearly the psalmist is uh, going to worship. He's engaged in worship, but he's led there by the truth, the word of God. Uh, that is exactly what leads us in worship as well. The Word of God is what leads us. And so uh, let's do as the psalmist has done. Um, let's be led into worship by the truth of the Word of God. And let's, let's engage and celebrate that together as we sing hymn 645 together, hymn 645. Please stand with me. Jesus, the fair bethought of thee, with sweetness fills my breast. But sweeter for thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. Nor voice can sing, nor heart can frame, nor can my memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name. O Savior of mankind, O hope of Be 
Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the Word of God, which reveals not simply that you're the Creator, but that you're, you have especially uh, uh, manifested your purpose and, and saved a people like us, that we might be the torchbearers of the truth to the nations. Today, as you've assembled us for worship, we pray that, again, you would appraise our worship uh, as appropriate unto you, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And again, that your name would be lifted up in us, that we would be moved to pant after you, to follow after you, and uh, to be your disciples, your learners, your followers. And in doing so, we would indeed radiate the truth to all. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we can certainly rejoice in the, the fact uh, that we're not saved because God infused us with righteousness, which has obviously failed, if you look at our walks with him, the way we walk. But rather, we have been declared righteous because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his perfect obedience for the life he lived here. Um, but it, it uh, proclaims a reality that we often, in every way and in every thought, don't walk with him. So I, and I trust you, are grateful for his declaration. Nonetheless, that reality moves us when we're confronted with it to confess our sin and to do so from, as we say, a position of peace, solidarity knowing that he's our consolation, that we can't be knocked off this rock in which he's put us on because we somehow reveal our sin. No, I want, I'm, I want to do this. I'm now led to do this uh, passionately because I know that it unites me practically with my Lord, practically with my Lord. If I'm harboring something against somebody and I don't go to them, there's something between us. I don't want, and you don't want anything between you and your Lord. So we need to confess our sin and make sure uh, uh, that there's, there's no practical barriers between us and him, that we're walking with him. So we'll do that. We're going we're gonna to be, I don't know if we've got visitors here, but we're going to pray this prayer that's in the bulletin. So open your bulletins. We're going to read this prayer, pray it together, and then we'll have a silent time of confession afterwards, and I'll close us. But when you read this prayer, which is short this morning, and, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, in its articulation lacks the ability to reveal uh, and confess all of our sin. Nonetheless, make this a prayer of your heart, and then when we pray silently, continue to confess uh, whatever sin might be on your heart. If you would, pray with me. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, now cleanse us from all our sins, from proud thoughts and vain desires. Deliver us, O Lord. Grant that with lowliness and meekness we may draw near to you. We confess our sins, we confide in your grace, and we find in you our refuge and our strength. Bear your good fruit in us and through us, through Jesus Christ, our life. Amen. Please continue to pray.
Again, oh God, what we prayed together corporately uh, was short. Um, and yet we know that uh, our sin uh, is boundless. It seems boundless in our thoughts and our, our actions. Um, and we're such a forgetful people, such a forgetful people. But we, we are grateful to you that you are not forgetful, that you remember the covenant which you've established with your people and that nothing can ever separate us from your love, your salvation, the life you've given us, the purpose you've established in us, and the glorious future you have for us. And so this morning, uh, we confess to you that we walk sinfully, we think sinfully, we are a forgetful people, and we, uh, we appeal to you for forgiveness which you have given us as a result of the work of Jesus Christ. And we're grateful that you have appropriated or applied uh, this forgiveness of salvation to us by the power of the Spirit in due time, and that we are assembled here together as the people of God, having been placed upon the rock, resurrected out of miry clay, which held us fast, and uh, now have purpose unto you and your kingdom. Our prayer is that you would cause us to be emboldened uh, with this purpose and to be soldiers who are marching forward and looking forward, not simply to the steps in front of us and our circumstances, but to the hope of glory which resides for us. And so thank you for the cross work of Jesus Christ. We, your people, are grateful, and we pray that you would grow our gratitude as we continue to march uh, under you and for you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 Well, listen to the psalmist in the previous psalm. There's interesting connections between these, but let me just read this. This is, And the order of the way the psalm, psalmist writes here is interesting and I think important. Uh, this is in Psalm 42. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning uh, because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him and my salvation and my God. Simply put, the psalmist uh, is reminded or reminds himself here by inspiration uh, that God's steadfast love is immovable. It is, yes, it is steadfast. He reminds himself of the very dogma which we've just in, uh, reminded ourselves of over the past few minutes here, that God saved us and nothing can separate us from us. He knows this. And then he he has a moment of reflection where he recedes and he realizes he's in bad circumstances and, and he, to put it in how we prayed and confessed, he's a forgetful man and he forgets the hope. He forgets this. And then he, he remembers the Jordan. If you go earlier in the psalm, he reminds himself to think upon Jordan, to think upon that event. And it brings him back. It brings him back like in Psalm 77. It allows the psalmist to go to sleep here, it brings him back to great joy and, and to cause him to focus upon the hope of Jesus Christ. So even though this is only three verses, it describes our life. <laughs> We're learners. We know God's word and we, we understand the truth. And yet we walk frustrated and, and uh, sometimes depressed and in dire circumstances and whatever they may be. And, and we forget God. And then we're moved by God to think of the Jordan, to think of the cross work of Christ, and then his hope is resurrected in us. So that's our life. If that characterizes you, and I know that's a broader way of saying if you're trusting in the cross work of Christ, but to trust in the cross work of Christ means something. It means that this is probably your life here. This is probably characterizes your life in, in some way. We're very cyclical, just like the the uh, nation of Israel, very cyclical. Who are, we love God. We forget him. We're sinners. We walk away. And somehow, God moves us back to him. He brings us back to him. Remember the Jordan. 
Um, remember the works of the Lord, Psalm 77, and he brings us back. If that characterizes you, you're saved. That, I'm not because I'm saying it, because the Word of God says it. This characterizes those who are a saved people. So if you are indeed trusting in Christ, in the hope of the last verse that I read, if, you're, if that's your, your trust, you're trusting in that, then count yourself among the brethren, those who are saved and can never be separated from the love of Christ. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> okay, well, let's celebrate that truth. Um, we'll do that now by together praising and singing hymn number six. Please stand with me. God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Continuing from our theme verse, given it will be given to you, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Doing a lot of reading lately on the idea of God's generosity. It's really amazing when you think of all the things that he has given. He is a creator God. John Piper talks about him being a creative fountain, that he just, the creativity just continues to overflow. The other theme that I have been reading about is gifting. And God created everything as a gift to the world. He created, think of Genesis and think of all the things that he created as gifts. Yet there was no one to really receive those gifts and appreciate them until he created man and woman in his own kind, after his image. How amazing that is, that, those, that the, the greatest gift, though, he held back, and that gift was Jesus Christ and our Redeemer. So again, think of the generosity of our Lord, how incredibly generous he has been, how kind he is to have given us all this. So I ask you to consider that as the ushers please serve us. Please pray with me. Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, we do consider all the things that you have given us, all the gifting that you've given us, and all the gifts that we should in turn give back, not only to you and in this way that we've given in this plate, but to give of ourselves, to give to our neighbors, to give to the world, because you've given each one of us a special gift. And, and the gift, of course, of Jesus Christ, how immense that is and our gratitude for it. So we do thank you and ask you for us to have wisdom as how we use these gifts to further the work here at Bethel. Lord, we are a needy people and we have many things that we can be concerned about. You know, our secular world sets today aside as being Mother's Day and that's probably more commercial than it is anything else. But we really need to consider every day to be Mother's Day. When I think of my own mother and we think of those that have gone before us and those that are still with us, as, as, they, as we sat by their knee and we learned about you. And how important that was and how important it is now that as children are being raised up, that their mothers are telling them about the love of Jesus and what that does. We are thank you for the mothers-to-be, that we have two among us with uh, Colleen and with Sarah, and we do ask for health for them and health for the babies, 
uh, as, as we look forward to meeting these covenant children at, at some future time. Lord, we know that there have been blessings as in, in our congregation. We think of Emily's father, uh, and we think of Kim's story and her sister Flora, and we saw the praises of, of this, this week uh, as well. Lord, we know that Lizzie Greenwich continues to suffer with pain, and we think, lift up this, this young servant of yours, and we ask that you would give the doctors wisdom and remove this pain that she is now so afflicted with and how terrible that must be. Uh, I, once again, we, we thank you for uh, all of the students. We see many of them returning here today. And we thank you for their travel, the safe travels, and we know that there's more that are coming. There may be some that are still finishing finals and wrapping things up. So we do ask that they would join us uh, this summer, that they would find fruitful work, and we would welcome these brothers and sisters among us as well. Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand that we are salt and light, to understand what our salvation is for, that we need to understand more what it means to be in the world, but not of it. Help us to meditate on those, those thoughts as we, again, uh, look at, at, at what, what our role is in, in the world. Lord, we, also, we often pray, we've, the number may be seven, it may be more or less, of people in this congregation that are challenged by their work. As I often pray, I know that even people that are employed, that is somewhat tenuous at times. Lord, we know about that. And Lord, I ask for protection for those that are working, and I ask for fruitful work uh, for those that need it. I particularly pray for Steve. I know that uh, this week that uh, he's, a he's asked for special prayers for his schedule, and I ask you to be with him uh, in that. Uh, and, and others as well, of course. Uh, Lord, I, I also, every week I, I look and I see all the missionaries. And Lord, I hope that each one of us, when, they, when, they, when we look over that list, many of these we've had the privilege of meeting over the years. And I think of their work and how difficult that work must be, especially in this, this age of, of modernism and, and modernity and all the things that postmodernism is, is doing in the world making people skeptics, but your work will go forth. Your work, your word will not come back void. And so I pray for you to, for, uh, for strengthening the, the missionaries in their work. Lord, I thank you for the, that in our denomination, they do not have to raise their own support and that, that these gifts that we've given in some way will help them uh, to be able to further their work of the kingdom. Or they're on that, 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 that front line. Lord, as we, in many ways, are on the front line as well. So strengthen us and give us the ability to do more to be able to further your kingdom in this world. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's conclude our time of uh, dedication by singing together hymn number 81, O Love of God, How Strong and True, hymn number 81. Please stand to sing. How strong and true, eternal yet and ever new, uncomprehended and unblocked, beyond all knowledge and all thought. The love of God, how deep and great, far deeper than the deepest Self itself kindled like the light, changeless, eternal, infinite. O oh, heavenly love, how precious still in days of weariness and ill, in nights of pain. To heal, to comfort, and to bless. Oh, wide embrace, wondrous love. We read you in the sky above. We read you in the earth below. In sea, Read 
you blessed him who came to bear for us the cross of shame sent by the fathers from on high our lives to live our deaths to die we read your power to bless and save e'en in the dark Please be seated. We read from Isaiah 12. Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Very short verse. And I pray that today, as we hear the word, as Greg brings it to us, that you will understand that that is the well of salvation. Family of God, turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Hopefully you all have begun reading this and perhaps even studying it as a family or as an individual. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 10 is the text that we are currently on, or that we're just going to begin this morning. We'll be on a couple weeks at least if not more, actually, actually more. But uh, we're going to walk away th uh, through this incredible passage indeed. Um, this is God's Word written to the church. And as we are the body of Jesus Christ, we know this therefore is written to us. However, as this is the word of a great king, let us out of reverence and respect for the, our, our great king stand at the reading of his word. Hear now the word of your Lord. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know of what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege that is ours now to have your word open in our laps and the privilege of ours to now sit and fellowship with you. But Lord, to sit up and sit actively, um, longing to study and learn and, and fellowship, Lord, now as we have your word. So Lord, we pray you would send forth your spirit, open our eyes, instruct our souls, and transform us indeed to the image of Jesus Christ. Give us the hope of eternity. 
and grow us, we pray in Christ. We commit this time now to you in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You all know what a cross-section is, I trust. Miriam, Miriam Webster defines it as a view or drawing that shows what the inside of something looks like, like after, um, I'm sorry, looks like after a cut has been made across it. In your bulletin, I, I put a little picture of a cross-section of a beaver den. Um, mine's in color, um, and uh, it shows a little bit better in a color. But if you look at that close enough, perhaps with reading spectacles, um, you will see how incredibly uh, designed this little den is. So the front door, back door, a place to eat, a place to sleep. Um, it just, it's an incredible little feat that God has enabled these beavers t- to do. These cross sections, you, whether it be a beaver den or a car or a plane or a house, they show the insides of whatever you, you are looking at and thereby enable us to understand what we're looking at in a way we wouldn't see just from the outside. Cross sections give us insight I'm into how things work. This morning, the passage at which we're looking is a cross section of a healthy church. Having just received the glorious news that the Thessalonians were were walking well and, and standing firm in their faith, Paul began reflecting upon this church, its beginnings, and their current situation. And he just abound with joy and gratitude. Notice with me verse 2 and 3. Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind. And then he quotes what they were doing today. And then he describes why they were doing it, the foundation upon which they were doing it. He goes into this lengthy description to really do two things. One, to praise God for what made this church what it was, but two, to encourage this church to continue being what it ought to be. So what we've got here in this pericope, in this passage, is this prayer of gratitude wherein Paul details not just what they're doing, but why and how and the basis and the foundation as a vehicle to encourage this church to continue being healthy. So I've titled this section, A Cross-Section of a Healthy Church. Now, a couple disclaimers. One, brothers and sisters, this is not a super church. This is not a magnanimously rare church. This is an average church in the ancient world. I mean, you think about it. This church is not commended as was the Berean church in Acts 17. The Berean church was more noble-minded than this church. And in fact, this church needed two epistles written to them, which means something. If you're doing great and you don't need instruction, you usually don't get it. But if you're, if you're struggling in some way, grappling in some way, Paul wrote a letter to you that this church, that this letter is in the Bible tells us this is not a super incredible church. This church is an average church in Paul's day with its struggles and its victories, its triumphs and its defeats. It's an average church. You and I have to see this. Because as we look at this chapter and the rest of this book, it will be tempting for us to go, man, that can never be us. This is an incredible church because Paul's writing to them. It's the exact opposite, brothers and sisters. This church was a struggling church because Paul's writing to it. And it wasn't more noble-minded. It didn't uh, uh, contain noble-minded Christians as existed in Berea. So, first disclaimer, please note, we're dealing with an average church. And that's what Paul writes here. He's describing this church, but he's also encouraging this church, instructing this church, guiding and leading this church. Think of it as parents. What parent is there who doesn't, from time to time, 
encourage their children in a way, in an area that they're not very good at, right? They're playing the piano. They sound like a broken seal. What, I'm not sure what, what a bad piano player sounds like, but they sound bad. And you come and say, wow, man, you know what? Compared to last week, you're sounding fantastic. Keep it up. And they're like, whoa, man, guys, that's what you do. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's encouraging this church. Secondly, Paul begins by expressing his gratitude. And then, as, as I've, I've referenced, he then goes into describing various and sundry attributes or descriptions of this church. Now, it is my intent that Bethel emulate this church. It's my hope and prayer that we look like this. And if that is true, then to look at this and study this, and to begin where Paul begins, he's simply thanking them. If we're going to emulate them, it's important, I'm going to suggest to you, that the better route is to look first at the foundation, the structure, the walls, the, um, the infrastructure that leads to, verse 3, their work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. What stuck out to Paul were those three activities of this church. But those three activities was the tip of the iceberg resting upon this incredible infrastructure. So to look at this, I want us to look at it backwards. We're going to walk through this passage backwards. Because it's as we go backwards, we see the foundation. Paul, I mean, in essence, looks at the outward into the inward. We're going to start on the inward, and we're going to work our way outward. So when we get to verse 3 and 2, it'll be abundantly clear and understandable as to what they were doing and why they were doing it, and thus enable us as a people to so emulate. So this morning, we're going to begin at the end, and next week, we're going to walk away backwards. And the end for us is found in verse 10b. Notice with me verse 9. Paul writes, they themselves report about us what kind of reaction we had with you. So notice he's describing their conversion how they turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. That's their, their conversion. We'll look at that next week. Then he ends with a creedal statement. Whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Commentators are quick to point out that that last phrase is not Pauline. You can study the way Paul wrote and the language he liked and the way he wrote his language. And you will say, yes, this is Pauline. This last is sort of Pauline, but it's distant. So it's very obvious that Paul is referencing an agreed upon confession of faith, which the people of God in the early days already were I'm adhering to. You see it in 2 Thessalonians 2. Go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Paul says, so then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the tradition which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. You know what that word tradition is? Confession. It's exactly, this is a creedal statement. Paul says, hold to the creed which I gave you. And thus, what we have here, the very last phrase, is this confession, which Paul obviously heard and told and shared. And this confession upon which this entire church rested. In fact, after today, I hope you, you'll see, wow, now I see why this church did what they did because of those three confessional, creedal um, uh, statements. We're going to look at them one by one. Notice the first one. This church was founded. Its, founda its founding creed was the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. Notice with me verse 10b again. Speaking of Christ, whom God raised from the dead. Okay, brothers and sisters, whether you realize or not, this was a crucial element, not just to Paul, but to the gospel proclamation. And not just was, it is a crucial element to the gospel. Paul wrote in, or we read of Paul in Acts 17, 18, preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Isn't that striking? You're reading on Acts, and 
Paul, on his second missionary journey, was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He's teaching about the person of Christ, who he was, and his resurrection. We read about it in Romans 10.9. Paul said as an essential element of the gospel confession that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The resurrection, brothers and sisters, wasn't just a doctrine. It was one of the most fundamental doctrines in, it still is, one of the most fundamental doctrines we've got as a people. Oh, there's a lot of doctrines you may disagree with that I might uh, profess. End times, eschatology, mode of baptism. Hey, we can disagree on that stuff and be fine. But you can't disagree here. If you disagree with this, you are now heterodox. You are no longer orthodox. You are heterodox. You are in error. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Notice, once again, an earliest recorded creed. I deliver to you what I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You know one of the earliest creedal affirmations of the church was that. And you see that reflected here. Thessalonians is written before Christ. A Corinthians, and here Paul, you got Paul quoting this creed. First statement, Christ rose. It is crucial to the gospel. And that is probably why there's so much debate about this doctrine, even in Paul's day. Acts 17, uh, 32, referencing Paul's uh, preaching. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Paul was preaching the resurrection, and his Gentile Greek... Uh, an audience began laughing at him. Resurrection? Are you nuts? It's always been a point of contention. 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ, if we, now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection? Even in Christ's day, there was debate and discussion and dissension. In Judaism, you know, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Matthew 22, 23. On that, on that same day, uh, some Sadducees who say there is no uh, resurrection, uh, they came unto Jesus. The resurrection has always been an object and a target in Satan's working. Why? Because he knows that if you deny the resurrection of Christ, you have no Christianity. Did you get that? If you deny the resurrection, you have no more a Christianity. There is no salvation. Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 13, If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. The church is founded upon this crucial doctrine. Christ rose from the dead. Now, why is this so fundamental? Well, the answer is it revolves around the basis upon which God can accept a sinner into his presence. Deny the resurrection. God cannot accept a sinner into his presence. Let me back up. Let me uh, review. When God made this world, you must understand, when he made this world, he created man. And when he created man, he entered into a relationship with man. But that relationship had boundaries, just like yours does. You've got a good friend. You're bound together. You're blood brothers, blood sisters. And that friend starts gossiping and telling your secret stories in front of you to other people. How much longer are you going to remain their friend? You see, your friendship is based upon agreed upon rules. What I tell you in confidence remains in confidence. If you break that, we don't have a relationship. Brothers and sisters, God's relationship with man was founded upon rules, agreements, and they were stated. And the stated rule was in Genesis 2 that if Adam disobeyed God, rebelled against God's authority by eating the tree of the, of the fruit, then God, by obligation, would kill him. Adam's obligation was to obey. God's obligation was to 
give him, or I'm sorry, keep him in life. But if Adam disobeyed, God's obligation was to kill him. And brothers and sisters, we know what happened. Adam sinned. And with Adam, all mankind. Romans 5, 18. So then through one transgression that resulted condemnation to all men. When Adam sinned, mankind became uh, guilty of foul, revolting against God and condemned. Now, God being rich in mercy and love, which Adam and Eve didn't know. They didn't know about that. They only with the angels saw God's awesome attributes, his uh, transcendency. They could not understand love or grace until they fell. Because of God's grace and kindness, God was not willing to allow man, his people, to perish. So God himself became man, born under the confines of the original relationship, perfect obedience, he upheld those confines, and then he died in our place. He gave us his life, his record, we, and he, re, he received our a record in our death, right? And hence, that is salvation. Now, the question is, why is it that it had to be God? Why couldn't a man have been our sacrifice? Why couldn't we just as, couldn't have Adam just agreed, as in pagan cultures, to take one of his children and sacrifice that child on an altar as a sacrifice in his place? Answer, do you know why? Because that child had his own sin to die for. Okay? You can't die for another person's sin before God. I mean, you could, but you first have to pay for your sin. And to pay for your sin, you got to die. So once you've died, you can't die a second time. So no man, no matter how well-intentioned they could be, could ever serve as a sacrifice. How about an angel? Couldn't be an angel. Angels are not under the covenant that God made with who? Man. That's the issue. Man. The only one who could ever uphold that is a man. So it had to be God. God had to become man. And as a, as a spotless being uphold that law, and then he, he sacrificed, gave us his life, we rece or he, uh, um, and he received our death. Had to be God. That raises a huge question. How do you know Jesus is God? I mean, the Caesars all claim to be gods. Napoleon Bonaparte thought he was a god. Alexander the Great thought he was a god. Is just Jesus, this Jesus character way back, just another false, uh, you know, uh, uh, deity? That's what the Muslims say. They say that Jesus is just a prophet. Nothing more. And any claim that he was anything more than a prophet is a perversion from his disciples. How do we know Jesus is God? How do you know that, brothers and sisters? Answer, the resurrection. Listen to Romans 1, 3. The resurrection is the event that proves the testimony of Christ. Romans 1. God's son, who was born, or speaking of, um, of, the, of the gospel, uh, Paul said, it concerns God's son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God, that means God, with power, by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of Christ proclaims his deity. If he's not God, no one's saved. If he's God, then whoever he died for is saved. Well, how do you know he's God? Because he rose from the dead. Acts 17, 31. Notice Paul's message to the Athenian a skeptics, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Christ is the proof that he's God. Now, how did the resurrection of Christ prove his deity? How did it do that? Because many people were raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead, right? The, um, so, uh, the uh, 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 a centurion's daughter was raised from the dead. 
So how do we know what, what they were raised for? The, are they gods? No. But Jesus is God because, get this, he raised himself from the dead. That's what makes him God. I want you to notice uh, with me, Matthew 27, 50. You can turn there and just listen. This is, uh, we're going to start with his death, and we're going to, uh, from that, extrapolate to his resurrection. Matthew 27, uh, 50. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, describing his crucifixion. Now, a couple of peculiar things. First, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. If you know anything about crucifixion, which most of you do, crucified people died not because of the nails in their hands or their feet. That won't kill you. What kills you is you suffocate. They typically take three days. You get nailed on a cross, and to breathe, you have to lift your body up to, to bring in air. To exhale, you have to let your body down. And so the, the death of crucifixion is an agonizing death, slow death, where the criminal lifts and, and let go all day, all night long. I'm sure he falls asleep, but he's awakening because he can't breathe. <clears throat> lift up. Breathe. Let down. As, you, as it goes on, the body uh, fatigues by the end. There is no way in a billion, zillion universes a human being crucified right before his death could cry out with a loud voice and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me or whatever he did? No way on earth. So the fact that this text tells us he cried out with a loud voice tells us Jesus was not at the end. Secondly, would you notice the, uh, the next phrase? Yielded up his spirit. To yield means basically to send away, indicating an act of volition. Do you understand what Christ did? Christ willed to die. Was he crucified? Yes. Are people culpable of killing him? Yes. But at the moment of death, Jesus Christ's life was not taken from him. He, by divine sovereign fiat, said, it is finished. And he yielded up his spirit. This text says, he gave up his spirit because he's God. Only God could do that. What man is there? Anyone here ever? I've tried it after having studied this passage. Die. I didn't die. Okay, I'll try it again. Die. I don't die. You cannot, as an act of volition, yield up your spirit. Jesus did. How could he do that? Well, now listen, John 10, 18. Jesus says, I have authority to lay down my life. You understand that? Christ said he has authority in his life. He said, I've got the ability to give up my soul anytime I want. That's the authority I have is God. But then he goes on, and I have the authority to take it up again. And that's where we link it to the resurrection. You've got to understand, when Jesus Christ was yielded up his spirit, God didn't raise him. He raised himself. But the scripture says God raised him. He did. But he didn't. Do you see what? It's both. God raised him. But Jesus Christ raised himself. The scriptures say, John 2, Christ says, destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and I will raise it up. Incredible passage, uh, Ephesians 4, speaking of his death and resurrection. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, that's his resurrection, not his ascension, his resurrection. He led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he um, ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had to descend into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended, he who died, is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Brothers and sisters, this passage tells us Jesus did it. Hebrews 2, he broke the power that Satan held over death. He broke it. Many have been resurrected, but only one person has ever broken the power of death by, him, by himself, and that's Jesus Christ. And thus, because he raised himself, it proves that everything he said was true, 
And that being true, everything he said is true. Therefore, he has the authority to forgive sins. So the resurrection of Christ is crucial to our salvation. Now, with the resurrection of Christ, I'm going to quickly say this. Romans 6 tells us that when a person is saved, they become united to his death such that they also participate or become united to his resurrection power. Do you understand what that means? That means as a church, we have resurrection power. We live in resurrection power. What that means is, is that we can endure hardship and suffering. We can honor God. We can serve God. Now, we are so used to quoting Romans 7, the things I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do, that I think, brothers and sisters, we now use that as an excuse uh, 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 for our sin, uh, for lethargy, right? I, 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 we, I tell my kids in school or sports when they say, I can't do that. I say, don't use that language. I want you, don't you dare say can't. Say I won't. Because that's what you, you're saying. You can't write a paper without misspelling that word. Yes, you can. The question is, do you want to? Now, not to disagree with Romans 7, of course it's a battle. The, the, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that we do not do the things that we please, Galatians 5. Understand that. But brothers and sisters, we are a people who have hope and anticipation of growing in holiness and perseverance and our walk with God because we are united to Christ and his resurrection. So, th so everything that you read about this church, that you might go, man, we could never do that. Man, I could never, what? They do. Oh, man, that couldn't be me. Yes, it can be you. It can be you. Because you are united to a risen, powerful, omnipotent Savior. You can grow in your walk. Stop making excuses. You can be faithful to your spouse. You can be faithful to your God. Oh, there may be setbacks here and there, but that doesn't mean you can't grow. You will grow. I am caught of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will complete it, says Paul in Philippians 1. So this first doctrinal foundation is, is key to our, to our faith, but also key to our body life. We live in resurrection power. And thus we live with hope and anticipation an expectation of what God is going to do no matter how many times we fall. The wicked stumble when they fall, but the righteous fall seven times. And what happens? They rise again an eighth time. Why? Because they have the hope of God. Resurrection. First cardinal doctrine. Second one, the sacrificial saving death of Christ. Notice with me, 10C. Once again, speaking of God, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who delivers us. We've already referenced this. I just did about his death and resurrection. Indeed, Christ came to save. However, the language that Paul uses here is significant. Notice Paul does not say, whom he raised from the dead, that is Christ the Lord. He could have said that. I mean, he raised himself. He doesn't say, Emmanuel. He doesn't say, the great I am. Instead, in fact, look at the phrase again. My, my passage has that is. It's not there in the original. Jesus sticks out like a sore thumb. Look at your text. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus. Do you see the way it's written? It just sticks out. It leaps off the page. Well, what's the significance of Jesus. Well, first of all, note that that was not Mary and Joseph's original desire to name this child. I'm sure just like you growing up, Mary had all three or four names, although in that day the men named, maybe he, Joseph, had three or four names. David. David's a good name. That's my great, 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 great grandfather. I'd like to name him David. Or possibly, you know, who knows, Ezekiel, you know, Isaiah, Mephibosheth. You know, who knows what was going through his mind? But when Mary conceived, the angel appeared to Joseph and said, according to God's will, you will name the baby Yeshua. What's Yeshua mean? God is salvation. And that's the significance here. God rose from the dead. Salvation! 
That's the way that this reads. Whom he raised uh, from the dead. Salvation. Who delivers us. It's a shout. Salvation. Another cardinal uh, doctrine of the church upon which it's built is the fact that it's built upon the saving, sacrificing work of Christ. Notice the word delivers. Who delivers us from the wrath uh, to come. Ra'amai. It's not the typical word for deliver or say. That's sozo. Soter, okay? That, that, this is a different word. It's, it's used very uh, uh, rarely in the New Testament, 19 times compared to, uh, to sozo. However, the significance of this word in this juncture is this. Of all the Old Testament words for deliverance, natsal is the main one. The primary word used in the Septuagint to translate natsal is ruamai. So to a, a Jew hearing this, Ruamai, they think of Nassal. And what's Nassal mean? Nassal means two things. It not only speaks of a deliverance from situations of hostility, but also preservation in God's gracious presence. It's not just a deliverance and then let the people go. It's a claiming where the person is kept in God's hands forever. The church is built upon this doctrinal creed. Christ rose himself from the dead, giving us resurrection power as a church. Thus, we are different than the Elks Lodge. We're a holy gathering. Secondly, we have been delivered from our sin and kept from our sin by God. We, that's an assumption we have as a people. Did you get that? We begin in the body of Jesus Christ with the assumption that we are forgiven sinners. Listen to that. Let that, let that penetrate your heart. We begin with the confession we are forgiven sinners. We begin there. My question is, where'd that confession go? The church no longer believes this. It's bad enough that the world doesn't believe it. Talk to most worldlings. Most worldlings believe you and I think that we're, that we're something special because we go to church. Most worldlings go, you think you're so good because you go to church. It's bad enough that the world says that, and our response back is, no, we're not here because we're so good. We're here because we're so bad. But we've lost it as a church. We've lost this confession. And whether or not you would say, oh, you mean we no longer say it? No, we all say it. We're forgiven sinners. But we don't believe it. We come here and put on the plastic show. We come here, act like we're morally superior people. I don't struggle with those things. And the result is none of us bears each other's burdens because we never hear about each other's burdens. Because we're all so busy faking it. How you doing, Greg? I'm great. Great. Fantastic. Got in a huge fight with my wife this morning. She doesn't like me anymore. Doing great. I blew my cool yesterday, slugged a hole in the wall. Doing great. Thanks for asking, brother. How you doing? Fantastic, too. Been struggling with pornography. Never hear that. Just doing great. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, brother. How you doing? Great. How can I pray? Pray that my four-hour quiet time might become a five-hour quiet time. Okay. I will. We lost the confession, brothers and sisters. You know what sticks out about this church? This church was sinners. This was not a church filled with incredible, higher, more, more higher than life individuals. This was a church who knew the resurrection power of Christ because they knew the forgiveness that comes from grace. And knowing the forgiveness that comes from grace enabled them to open up and stop playing the silly games that we play as a church. It's so self-defeating. The culture of the church today will not allow an elder or a church leader to struggle with sin. Did you know that? And because we won't allow an elder or church leader to struggle with sin, they're left to struggle with sin by themselves. 
And you know what happens when a sinner struggles with sin by themselves? Eventually they embrace the sin they're struggling with by themselves. And you wonder why that pastor and that pastor and that pastor are falling out of the ministry because of moral compromise. Why? Because they don't have a church where they can be honest with their leadership, their brothers who who follow lead and say, I'm struggling here, pray for me. This church had that. This church began with the presumption we are forgiven sinners. Such were some of you. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians. He mentions homosexuality. But I'll tell you what, there's a homosexual here that you don't know about it, do you? No one knows about it. Because if they confessed they were homosexual, they would be ostracized. They would be made fun of behind, behind closed doors. Liars, deceivers, uh, 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 murderers. Man, I'll never uh, forget the, the time my first church, a guy came to me and confessed, I'm guilty of murder. No one knows about it, but I'm guilty of murder here. Really? Tell me about it. I'm thinking manslaughter got in a car wreck. Oh, no. He murdered his friend. And his conversion was at his trial when his friend's parents, who were saved, asked for his forgiveness and shared the gospel on the closing you know, time. They shared the gospel, and this man sat there and heard it, and it's what brought him uh, to salvation. But he couldn't share that. I can't share that testimony, because if I do, I'll be ostracized as a murderer. Not so at Corinth. Everyone knew who was a murderer. Everyone knew you were homo- homo- ex-homosexual, ex-murderer, ex- ex-adulterer. For brothers and sisters, we're sinners. Bethel will, will know apostolic church when Bethel gets over its love affair with our pride and our arrogance and can be honest and real. How you doing? I'm fine, but these are the areas you can pray for. Notice the third core doctrine upon which the church at Thessalonica was built, the doctrine of the final judgment. Verse 10e. Speak, uh, beginning to back up. Whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. This, this is not a very popular doctrine, as you know, um, in the church. In fact, many in the church now today are completely denying it, rejecting it. And yet you must see God's wrath and the punishment of hell, which comes as a result, is, a, is, is the most sp- uh, spoken about topic in the Bible. Did you know that? Top two topics in the Bible, money and, and hell. Hell is the most frequently referenced doctrine or topic in the Bible. In fact, we read in Psalm 7, 11, God is, right, is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. Yes, he's a God of grace. Praise God uh, for that. But do you understand this text says God is a God of indignation every day? Is your Santa Claus view of God so tainted that you don't recognize that anymore? Do you wake up understanding that the God you serve is an angry God? I don't think you do. Notice Psalm 80, verse 4, Asaph wrote, O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry? Hebrews 3, God said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Revelation 6, 16, speaking of the, non, of the non-Christian, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of the wrath has come, and who is able to stand? God is a God of wrath. That was a foundational, doctrinal pillar upon which this church rested. What is wrath? I got the definition there for you in your notes. You can follow along as I I read. In the Bible, orge is a word for wrath, refers to settled indignation. It is the opposite of blowing up. This is not to say that it, it does not include a subjective element, for it does. So when used of God, it speaks not just of punishment, it also is a holy revulsion of God's being against the objects of his wrath. Thus, to say the wrath of God is not only to say something about what God does, but also about what he is in doing it. He's displeased. And so when used of God, it carries with it the twofold idea of judicial punishment and divine displeasure, anger. 
Now, amazingly, this divine displeasure is being stored up. Listen to Romans 2, 5, and 6. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. This passage tells us at least uh, two things. One, there is no sin uh, committed by the sinner in this life that will escape God's notice. Notice the phrase storing up wrath. There's no sin anyone commits that can be hidden from God. It will, it will not be forgotten. The phrase storing up wrath actually in the Greek, storing up, is a positive word. Paul is being incredibly um, uh, a cunning here, I guess would be the way. He, he's using a pun. He's taking the language of the non-believer and turning it on him. Non-believers walk around believing that because they do good things, they're storing up for themselves a glorious future. Right? Think of the days of those of you who were uh, converted late. That's me. I became a believer as an adult. I remember as a kid, I'd do good things, and I'd go, God will, will bless me. God likes me because I do good things. So the believer, the believer, the non-believer goes to, his, to the grave with the idea that I have treasured up, stored up all these wonderful things. This word in the Greek is the word used to saving money in a, sa in a bank account. They're storing up slowly but surely. Ooh, how much? Ooh, yes, it's up to 2,000. 2,300, woohoo! Next month, 2,400, interest, whatever, right? Um, that's the idea, treasuring it up. And that's what non-believers do. They treasure up the good deeds, thinking that somehow God will be happy with them. Paul says, you're right. You are storing up. You're storing up a lot for God. Yes! You're storing up wrath. There's not a sin that God misses. If you are without Christ this day, every sin you've ever committed, God it will punish you for on the day of judgment. That is why a theologian once wrote, if the sinner um, only knew how bad his sin really is, the payment of, of it, um, he would wish that he'd have one, just one less sin as he suffered in hell. Just decrease my amount by one, Lord. That will be a relief to me. They're storing up wrath. Uh, uh, secondly, we learn from Romans 2, there will be a time in the future when God executes judgment on account of every sin. He says about they're storing up wrath for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is referencing the last judgment which is spoken about throughout Scripture, Matthew 10. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. Don't fear those who are killing you or persecuting you. Every person who sins will render account for on the day of judgment. 1 Peter 4, And all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation. They malign you, but they shall give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Believers will stand before that judgment. 1 Corinthians 4, I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of the Christian's heart. So we will also will stand before the judgment seat of God. But get this. The believer stands before the judgment seat of God with the knowledge, the certainty, the assurance that they will be vindicated on that day. You and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as horrifying as that may sound. And all of our sins will be exposed. But in the end, we know it will be well with our soul. We will be vindicated because of Christ. The non-believer, on the other hand... On that day, the non-believer brothers and sisters will enter into hell. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which, which has been prepared for you and for uh, the devil, devil and his angels. What will the state be like uh, for the non-believer? Well, John 5, 29 calls it a resurrection of judgment. Non-believers are raised up to suffer. Did you get that? To suffer spiritually 
emotionally and physically. Romans 2, 8 and 9 equates it with, with daily experiencing the wrath, indignation, tribulation, and distress of God. What are non-believers doing the moment they die? They began an eternal suffering in which they are the, the, the individual recipients of an omnipotent, eternal, and unchangeable wrath, indignation, tribulation, and distress. Isaiah 66, listen to what Isaiah wrote. Then they, will, they, God's people, will go forth and look on the corpse of the men who have transgressed against God. For their worm, their worm, a possessive, their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. This speaks, just like Dickens and Marley, this speaks that every sin a non-believer commits is creating greater wrath and condemnation for themselves. Every sin, and thus their worm, they've got a worm assigned to them. They've got a fire assigned to them because of their sin. Brothers and sisters, as awesome and brutal a reality that this is, nevertheless, it's true. And this is as distasteful as it may be. I know today we don't like to speak about it. Joel Olstein has found a church empire by not talking about it. I don't like to be negative, he says. I like to only speak positive. Brothers and sisters, a cardinal foundational creed of this church was the doctrine of the wrath of God. Why is it so crucial? I've got it written there. We'll wrap it up. This is a crucial doctrine upon which a healthy church rests, for don't miss it. Without it, there's no gospel, no mission, no urgency. If we reject this doctrine or forget about it, we are left with the message of Protestant liberalism, a God without wrath, brought men, bought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. Any hope there? None. You wonder why the, the church today doesn't have a passion for the lost? Why don't you have a passion for the lost? Because you've forgotten the doctrine of the last judgment. Plain and simple. This church didn't. And so this church's witness resounded. Churches that, that keep in mind the doctrine of last judgment, it sobers them. As I've written here, you're, we become a church that's sobered and that it knows that this world is not a game. People dying today without Christ are entering into a horrible place of suffering. We become a church that is understandably frightened and that it knows that the day is drawing near when every non-Christian will be held accountable for every sin. We become a church awakened, and that it knows that someday it too will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We become a church that is cautioned, and that it knows that the wages of any and all sin is the cruel death of the spotless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we become a, a church moved to action, and that it knows that as long as there's life, there's still hope. Hope for reconciliation, hope for forgiveness, hope for new life. So how do you explain what we're going to see in the coming weeks amongst the Thessalonian church? What we see here may sound like pie in the sky, but it's not. If you and I hold, hold firmly as a church to three fundamental doctrines, we will indeed be a healthy church. Those doctrines being... On the third day, Christ rose from the dead, demonstrating his deity and so his sovereignty to forgive sin. As a result, we live in light of his resurrection power and forgiveness. Secondly, Christ came to the earth as a sacrifice to die in the place of the sinner and reconcile them unto God. As a result, there's no place for pride or unforgiveness in the body of Jesus Christ or arrogance. Thirdly, the end of the world is real, at which time all mankind will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and render account for the deeds done while living. As a result, we are burdened to place the hope of the gospel in the hands of one another and the lost. That is why the Thessalonians were who they were. May God give us the grace to cherish these doctrines as well. Let's pray. Father God, we confess that, I, at least I confess, God, I look at this list, this foundational doctrinal creed, and I, I wonder, how did I 
very subverge so far away from this. Resurrection, such a cardinal part of the gospel. Oh, we have a whole presentation of sharing the gospel that doesn't even mention the resurrection. Father, you're, you're sacrificing life, which therefore makes me a forgiven sinner. God, I thank you for your sacrificed life, but I don't view myself as a sinner. And then, Lord, your, your incredibly sobering message of judgment. Father, I know it's not peace and safety in the world in which we live, but I'm not thinking of my neighbor in light of this truth. I'm thinking of me, and I'm thinking you, Lord, I'm not going to be, be a part of that. I'll be vindicated. God, I pray that you would give us the grace to restore the main thing to the position of the main thing. That, Lord, we would keep it there, and it would be before our eyes. And that we as a church would be a people ever mindful of this, of this core doctrinal affirmation. That, Lord, we therefore would allow this to drive us in our struggle against sin, in our struggle with worldliness, in our struggle with indifference, in our laziness. And that, Lord, it would drive us to be in your word, to be a people who value Jesus Christ more than life, to be a people who, who long to see uh, or, or long not to see the neighbor damned eternally to be a people who therefore worrying more about your glory and their, their life are willing to sacrifice our pride or our reputation on the altar of that throne. God, we, we, we pray as a church, transform us by the renewing of our minds that you might be exalted, that we might be your servants upon this earth. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.